Hey everybody, Sam here. We've got some great news to share and also a favor to ask. We're in the running for this year's People's Choice Podcast Awards in both the People's Choice and Technology categories, and we would really appreciate your support. To nominate us, you'll just head over to twimlai.com slash nominate, where we've linked to and embedded the nomination form from the award site. There, you'll need to input your information and create a listener nomination account. Once you get to the ballot, just find and select This Week in Machine Learning and AI on the nomination list for both the Adam Curry People's Choice Award and the This Week in Tech Technology category. As you know, we really, really appreciate each listener and would love to share in this accomplishment with you. Remember, that URL is twimlai.com slash nominate. Feel free to hit pause and take a moment to nominate us now. Hello and welcome to another episode of Twimble Talk, the podcast where I interview interesting people doing interesting things in machine learning and artificial intelligence. I'm your host, Sam Charrington. For those interested in our Fast.ai study group, but who haven't been able to make it to our live sessions, make sure you check out our recap videos via either the meetup page or our YouTube channel at youtube.com slash twimlai. In this episode, I'm joined by Jillian McCann, head of cloud engineering and AI at WorkGrid Software, which offers an intelligent workplace assistant that integrates with a variety of business tools and systems. In our discussion, which focuses on WorkGrid's use of cloud-based AI services, Jillian details some of the underlying systems that make WorkGrid tick, including a breakdown of its conversational interface. We also take a look at their engineering pipeline and how they build high-quality systems that depend upon external APIs. Finally, Jillian shares her view on some of the factors that contribute to misunderstandings and impatience on the part of users of AI-based products. And now, on to the show. All right, everyone, I am on the line with Jillian McCann. Jillian is head of cloud engineering and AI at WorkGrid Software. Jillian, welcome to This Week in Machine Learning and AI. Thank you. Thanks for having me. It's great to have you on the show. Why don't we get started out by having you tell us a little bit about uh, your background and how you got involved in AI? Yeah, so um, I have been working, um, I'm an engineer at heart, really. Um, and I've been working very much in the public cloud space the last couple of years. Mm-hmm. Um, but recently, I've started to look at what, um, how we can use conversational AI, uh, specifically around chatbots and voice within the employee space. Um, so I have WorkRed Software is um, a wholly owned company of Liberty Mutual Insurance. Um, and what we've done there is... A lot of the great products that we've built internally for employees that have used, you know, different aspects of conversational AI, we've decided that, you know, it solved a lot of problems for us within the enterprise, within a large global company, that, you know, there is potential there to, you know, create a product that can be used across companies worldwide. So last year, we created that company, a separate entity, and that's now my focus, um, you know, it's cloud engineering and AI. And it's really how you can apply artificial intelligence within employee-focused um, products. Can you give some examples of the types of employee-focused products that you're working on there? Yes. So our initial product um, is called the WorkRed Assistant. Um, and the aim of that is really like building an intelligent workplace assistant. You know, not everybody is fortunate enough to have a PA, you know, a person who is able to, you know, make take notes for them or create their to-do lists. Um, so we're looking for a way to create, you know, a product that can really help um, employees, you know, with 
productivity gains um, and engagement and job satisfaction. And some of the key areas that the product would have, you know, focuses on is, um, you know, approvals and workflows and really the automation and the aggregation of a lot of um, internal systems in that one place with a really, you know, modern and intelligent intuitive interface of which includes, um, you know, a chatbot. Um, so conversational interface is, is part of this as well, which is really where our initial focus of AI is. Mm-hmm. Um, so, I mean, so some of the use cases that we talk about. Um, so, as I say, this is stem from, you know, work we've done within Liberty Mutual is that we really focused on some of, I'd say, central um, employee functions like HR, IT help desk, just general productivity um, and how we can, you know, automate um, and provide also like a conversational interface to many systems so that, you know, employees can find the information they need when they need it. Um, you know, and the questions that are asked across offices day in, day out can be very simply you know, automated um, and give them, you know, again, that engaging experience. And is WorkGrid primarily building software for the use of Liberty Mutual or are you, um, is it more like a spin out where you're commercializing this uh, for the broader marketplace? It's um, the commercialization, really, of a product that we built internally for ourselves. Okay. Um, it's actually dating back several years ago. You know, we went through a transformation, I think, around 2014. Um, and we looked at the marketplace, and we didn't see anything there that really would, um, you know, benefit us in the way that we wanted. We wanted to bring all our underlying enterprise systems and tools that, you know, we use day in, day out, and aggregate it and give a simple place for people to go and do their daily work. Um, you know, so instead of going into many different applications where you're literally just going in six, seven screens to click a few buttons, it just um, brings that one place that you can actually achieve your daily work. Um, and we evolved that, you know, in um, uh, last year uh, into building into it part of that is a chatbot, which is, you know, it's a conversational AI and it's using like natural language processing and conversational analytics to really, you know, try and find what our employees um, pain points are and also to help automate some of that. Uh, and what's been the adoption like of the chat bot interface in particular? There's uh, there's an article recently, it was in uh, Inc. Magazine, and it was an article with uh, a guy who was like founder of a startup. And the headline of the article was something like, chat box killed my company or killed my startup. And the idea <laughs> was that like he built his startup around this, you know, what he now sees as a fad. And he found that people really didn't want to use chatbots. Uh, and so I've been asking folks uh, ever since seeing that about conversational interfaces, like where do they think, you know, or where do you think we are in terms of adoption? Or And is this a way that people want to engage with software? What have you seen? So I would say um, chatbots to me are you know, the future. When I say that, what I, what do I mean by a chatbot? I think everybody mm-hmm. has different perceptions of what a chatbot is. Mm-hmm. You know, is it a simple bot you order flowers on on Facebook Messenger or is it Alexa? It's literally, um, mm-hmm. you know, the, the definition is like your ability to talk to a machine through natural language. So we do have, you know, on many levels of that, if you know what I mean. So like I say it's very much voice. Um, is the future, um, the future interface. So when we talk about chatbots, that's what I have in my head, that it does make sense in a lot of different contexts, but it also, you know, it doesn't mean you have to have one. Sometimes the visual interface works better. Um, so it's not like everybody has to rush out and build a chatbot, but I think everybody should consider when the conversational interface actually works better, you know, very much um, you know, like the one we have, you're sitting at your desk, you want to ask a simple question, um, maybe about an HR policy, or you want to get some information about how do we have like reset passwords from the IT help desk. Would you rather have a two second chat with a chatbot or a 10 minute phone call? So mm-hmm. people are good for the, it's the use case that really drives the use of the chatbot. So we have, you know, it's still in, um, I would still it's like a, an evolving technology, but it's not really the NLU or the AI piece that's evolving. It's the use case, understanding when that context or then that conversational interface makes more sense. 
Um, and also the actual piece of the conversational design. What does the chatbot say? Um, if you don't design it well, the conversation doesn't flow well. Um, and then chatbots do fail. You know, so there's a lot more than just the AI piece. It is, um, I think, good conversation design, good understanding of your users and understanding the benefits that this will bring. Um, and then also, as I say, like, you know, the evolution of chatbots into a voice. Um, I, I definitely think... I mean, you can just, I don't know if you've seen the figures of, you know, how many Alexas were, bu- were bought at Christmas, mm-hmm. you know. So there's like, I think there's um, stats like one in six American households have a smart speaker, you know. So you may think about that. Um, those are all chatbots okay. in the definition of, um, you know, using natural language to talk, you know, interface with computers. So don't know if that answers your question. Okay. Yeah, no, it does. It, I, I, I appreciate that broader definition of chatbot. And I think, you know, when, when we vision kind of the future of human computer interactions, I, I don't think that there's much of a question for most people that it's a natural language based, uh, conversation that, you know, extends beyond kind of the, fa- you know, like the example you gave, the Facebook Messenger bot. Um, it's not so much that, you know, that, rectangular interface that defines chatbot but the this means of interacting with the computer via natural language you mentioned that the first step is understanding when to apply this type of approach to a given use case do you have any guidelines that tell you when or is it kind of i'll know it when i see it i think it's a bit of both like really some use cases just don't make sense Mm -hmm. um you know if I, if I think about things that, um, you know, that you're used to seeing, like, lists of things, like something that's very visual, if that makes sense, um, you know, like, we, we, we talk about, like, if you, if you were to ask about all the, um, for example, like, the Amazon deals of the day, you know, you, you know the way you see everything, it's like cards, there's lots of um, visual input that you can take. Mm-hmm. If you ask that in a chatbot, what, how could you get that sort of information the same way you know it just be a big list of words right. that it doesn't really make sense um but you know we have found like with the employee space it has been um like really listening to what employees are asking for um and some of the things are just like very simple one-off sort of actions um or like requests we do find a lot of of the use cases within the workplace seem to be centered around a more intelligent search you know, actually being able to have more direction into um, more directed questions, really, than just, you know, typing in a search bar. Mm-hmm. Um, so, you know, it, essentially, we just have worked through them and decided, like, what makes sense, what doesn't make sense. Um, I do think there is, a, especially in some of the work that we had done, like, you do realize that the user's expectations are um, sometimes, like, very, well, they're very high. They're very high when you start talking about, um, any form of AI, and I don't know if you've come across this, it's like it's either very high or very low. <laughs> um, <laughs> does, does that make sense? It um, does. So, like from a chatbot perspective, um, like, I think it, we have had uh, an education ourselves. You know, we have under like like the development team and, and and the guys really like how do you build like intents and utterances and fulfillments and train the model. What technologies do you use? Do you build your own? Do you use somebody else's? Um, you know, so there's a lot of that. But like when we're talking with the users, it, it's like an expectation that it's all going to magically, like it's magic. If you type something in, um, you know, like what's the weather, that the chatbot will know how to answer it. And this sort of explanation, well, guys, it's still code. We still have to write that. If we want the chatbot to actually know the weather, we have to program it, we have to train the model, and we have to ultimately call an API that tells us what the weather is. But it, it's that perception of, like, if I repeatedly ask it what the weather is, it'll learn. That We've heard that, like, it'll learn what I say. It says, well, it'll not learn until we update it. It's not a magical box that just learns things. So I think there's, like, the expectations, if that makes sense, has been very interesting to see. Um, and then on the other side is, um, you know, people who just think that they're not very good. Chatbots aren't very good. The NLU is not very good. Um, but we're sort of in a place where it's never been any better and it's only going to get better. Um, so, you know, I think what we have found also is the very importance of, like, what we call conversational analytics in that 
you're understanding what is being and you understand what the bot's saying or what's being said to the bot but you know you may not be able to answer but if everybody's asking for what's the weather then potentially that's the feature you add um so you know just that analytics of what's being said missed utterances missed intents um how well are you fulfilling the actual user intent how well are you performing um and that's really driven some use cases too just to refine what we have um because it is a great way if you you know give the bots to like a, a pilot group you know you can actually through what they're asking it and how they're chatting to it um actually see maybe what they want it to do um, and it does surprise you in some ways um, and also the realization that you know different cultures and different language have different ways of even saying hello um, so we find all that like if we've rolled it out still in the pilot within Liberty Mutual um, you know we, we see that because it's a global company but it, it's been very interesting I do think chatbots if they're designed well um, and they perform real actions are very powerful do you feel that the this magic that some users expect where the chatbot is going to learn uh, how to understand what the user is asking do you feel that that is just kind of organic or uh, does it has it come about because we throw around terms like machine learning that people don't really understand? I would say yes. <laughs> <laughs> In short, yes. Um, and I think AI, artificial intelligence, uh, machine learning, deep learning, you know, there's a lot of words bandied about. Um, and I do think there is a, you know, if we say machine learning, that somehow that it's it's going to learn how to do these things but like when you you know and I'm not an expert you know but I have read some stuff you know the differences between supervised and unsupervised machine learning and deep learning is a different form is that once you start getting into it it, it is much more evolved and you know the data that you have the training data um it can only it can only be as good as the, the data you have and the historical data for supervised learning um so I don't think everybody really you know, they don't need to know that, but I think, um, like, once you start having an interest in it, then you do start reading these things. You do get a better awareness of it. But I definitely think, yeah, the terms and just everything has got some element of AI, apparently, in it now. <laughs> um, you know, there's a lot of products say that. Um, when you d- dive into it, I think a lot of it is really automation and workflow, and, and they're all great things. But I think, you know, there's a bit of a buzz, as you know, um, and it's applied when potentially it, it's not it's not artificial intelligence, it's something else. It's um, you know, let's say some great there's great products out there, and a lot of it, you know, I'd say it's more like process automation, um, which is very valuable too. Yeah, basically every enterprise software product is some automation, <laughs> some workflow automation uh, underneath, right? All right, so you've you've got some use case. You think it could be a good fit for some type of chatbot. Then the the next question is, how do you get there? Uh, and you were speaking at the AWS conference, so you went the cloud direction. There's also um, you know building your own. How did you evaluate the the different options and come to the conclusion that you came to? Yeah, so that's a good question. Um, so I did look at a lot of different options. Um, I think really, you know, the first thing was, and it's for in general about chatbots, I think you have to think about where are the channels or the clients that you want to put that chatbot in. You know, who's the customer? Is it a like a customer facing or is it an internal one that like more like the employee stuff that I have been working on? You know, just a, an understanding of generally what the chatbot um is going to do but also those channels because a lot of the like the channels have their built-in frameworks that really make it easier to build um i think you know if you're thinking about building chatbots you have to assess your development capabilities as well like obviously um i'm working from a like an architect uh, engineer you know i know how to write code so those things are not going to put me off but if you're just in general interested about chatbots there are a lot of great frameworks out there that can get you up and running um now obviously then um some of the research we did is into well understanding what type of chatbot you're trying to build you know and there is a framework you can sort of assess it against an open domain chatbot versus a closed domain chatbot 
um, close domain is um, a lot easier in that it's like a very set purpose. As I mentioned, order flowers or um, order a pizza, order a taxi. Those types of chatbots are a lot simpler because mm-hmm. they're only expected to do one thing. And if you started to ask a pizza bot about the politics, you're not really expecting it. Do you know what I mean? There's expectations. Um, But what we were working in was more open domain in that there's a wide range of questions an employee in a large company can ask, even within HR or IT help desk um, use cases. So, you know, we looked, we needed to find something then that would help us build um, a more open domain chatbot. Um, And then also, you know, we're not really getting into the differences. So the difference between like retrieval and generative, you know, most chatbots in production today are retrieval based um like a generative one is you know we really are getting into you know um absolute true artificial intelligence in that you know something like, like it didn't go very well microsoft hey but they built you know the chatbot itself is generating a response versus retrieval based um, and retrieval based is obviously in a professional workplace um you know it's it's the thing that we initially you know, you need to deliver that. So you can't really start looking at how can I build a chatbot that's going to, you know, come up with <laughs> the answers itself. You know, that's out the realms of the, the AI capabilities of where we are today from a company perspective, I would say. Um, but then I looked at, um, so, you know, we wanted a, um, a natural language chatbot rather than like a command sort of, you know, do this, do that. Um so we want the natural language, looked at um, the main cloud providers, I suppose. We said Google, Microsoft, Amazon. Um, so, you know, I am an AWS cloud architect. So I am slightly biased <laughs> for, <laughs> towards one. But uh, we did. I did look at um, Microsoft's cognitive services are really great. Google's, um, you know, there's some great stuff there. But Amazon and AWS was what was chosen because it's more than... It takes more than NLU to build a chatbot for thousands of people. It takes um, many different services and capabilities. And, you know, AWS was our provider of choice at that time. So it really made sense just to, you know, work with them and pick a technology that sort of fitted that AWS ecosystem. And luckily enough, um, it's not last year, but the year before, they announced Amazon Lex um, as a new service. Uh, in preview and um, immediately that was the one that then we wanted to work with um, and we partnered really with them to develop you know they were in preview to develop the capabilities that we needed um, and as I say it worked really well because it's more than AWS Lex that builds it it's it's a wide range of the services and um, it gives it that real scalability um, and analytics and good engineering practices. What have been some of the things that you've needed to build around it to arrive at a complete solution yeah so interesting enough that was really what the um the session at reinvent was that i did last year was it's more than lex (laughs) um so what so i mean what we had to provide was really um i think the analytics was very important you know being able to um, analyze and store um elements of conversation so we could gain insights um, we use like APIs um, and storage um, so that we actually can, you know, um, review conversations. Um, so we essentially built an architecture, a serverless architecture around Lex. Um, so Lex provided the NLU, uh, but then also like if we wanted to, it's initially we focused on um text chatbot but obviously then voice as I mentioned you know obviously is a, is a the next step so you know using um, AWS Poly um, to really you know have both experiment with both and then as we move into you know really looking at the devices in the home I said beside her is the Google Assistant um, which I have started looking at too so there's really powerful technology out there um and it's just, you know, as I say, picking, picking the things that work for you. Um, and ultimately, the AWS um, ecosystem was very much in place for us. So, so the Lex was the extra piece. And once they, they brought that out, that seemed to definitely make sense. Um, and then, you know, as I say, we're talking about reInvent. Some of the things we're talking about reInvent wasn't really um, 
you know, the AI aspect of it. It was how do you build the chatbot at scale? How do you test the chatbot? How do you have CI, CD pipelines for chatbots? Um, so it was really about good engineering practices applied to um, like new technology like this. And also very importantly, I mentioned it before, is the conversational design. You know, what does it say? How does it interact with you? You know, you want to give your users a very good experience. Um, and what you have really have to do is just between the team is, you know, talk it out, script it out, uh, pretend you're the bot. Um, so it's actually quite fun. <laughs> Um, it's a fun way to develop but um, you can definitely see that it's a skill that you know we've had to build within a small team Mm -hmm. Um, but I definitely have to say voice um, this interface um, you know it's a capability that we need to grow um, just in general I would say within the engineering community How big is your team now? So WorkGrid Software now so the original Liberty Mutual team was four or five WorkGrid Software now we have um you see about eight or nine so it's slightly bigger but as i say the conversational ai is just one piece of that it's a larger assistant um so we're all working hard um to really bring this because i really i mean we do honestly believe that you know you should value your employees you should value their time um and you should really try and help them um you know when they need to have when they have questions that need answered, you can answer them quickly, but also you know provide them that one place to go so they can do their you know to do list notifications, approvals, all, all those things that are a day to day hassle sometimes, but mm-hmm. you still have to do them. Um, you mentioned analytics on a number of occasions. Can you talk a little bit about the analytics that you use and um, what? frameworks or tooling you've built to um, support the way you want to analyze the conversations yeah so um so i was at the moment i would classify them as um quite well standard analytics with a plan for more improved insights so the analytics we have at the moment um so we're using um things like amazon's Elasticsearch and athena um to give us you know, real time, so it's in real time that we can actually see. So the, the key things around the chatbot is the um, the conversation flow, um, the missed utterances and missed intents, where that terminology is, if we're not aware, um, like if you say something like book me a meeting with Gillian McCann and it goes, sorry, I didn't understand, and it repeatedly says that, it's like that we, do, we haven't modeled that conversation within the chatbot. So we're going to see, you know, what people are asking that doesn't match or what we actually find more important was miss, we called the mismatch intense. It did match something, but it matched the wrong thing. So you're trying to book a meeting and it's giving you the cafe menu. So <laughs> <laughs> yeah, just, so, that, so it's, it's the, to me, that's the performance of Lex or performance of the NLU itself. How well have we created um, the model, how, what sample utterances have we provided? Is it something we can train? Are people saying things in a different way than you actually expected? So then we we see those, we're able to see that and we're able to, you know, bring that back into the Lex model and immediately retrain it. Um, but then we have analytics on more, I'd say from a user, user context, sort of like um, very high level, job roles or location is there specific questions that are coming from a specific office you know that maybe will help you gain insights into well why is a problem there not here why are they asking that um so that's the um that's where we're at at the moment as i said to me they were quite standard stuff but with the plan to be more involved um with really it gets into what i call the key thing in any conversation is context right so the context and we have different levels of context Um, at the moment it would be things like the user like the office location um, job role Um, how does that context impact the answer or the conversation so really when I talk about a personal assistant you want it personalized to you so it understands you know you so context from a user perspective um, then context also could include the device that you're on and the capabilities that it has um, and then getting into what I like to call it's like the short term and the long term memory the conversational context um, where we can 
understands, you know, what you've previously said within this conversation. There's nothing worse than somebody, you say something to somebody and then two minutes later they completely say the same thing or ask the same question again. They haven't remembered what you said. So it's really, you know, how do we train the chatbot to not be annoying like that? So, that, you know, in that example, can I book a meeting with Jillian McCann? Yes, what time would you like? And then you say something and then jump back to, is she free at 3 p.m. tomorrow? The she has to refer to me. Right. Do you know what I mean? We need to build that in. And that's, so that's the context. And then longer term is where I would like to get to, is that we can start using predictive analytics. You know, we understand your patterns. We understand that you ask for the coffee menu for Friday. Um, why don't we send you that in advance? Why don't we talk to you? Um so it's getting, that's what I mean. So it's an evolving path and that's where, you know, we start looking look at other areas of AI, you know, potentially machine learning. If we've got like a history of conversations, can you predict what the next conversation is going to be? Would that be useful even? What would that do? So I think the base of all this is getting, um, and that's what we've put in place is the foundations of what I said, good quality analytics. And then we can evolve it and look for insights and hopefully, you know, give employees that better experience as it learns, as it gets better. You mentioned also that one of the topics you covered was about the deployment, scale, CI, CD pipelines, all that kind of stuff. Uh, can you give us an overview of the kind of things that you have done there to facilitate building out these kinds of applications on the engineering side? Yeah, um, so... Um, like for any standard um, application, you know, we have certain practices. Um, we would run unit tests, integration tests. We would run those locally. You check your code in. The build pipeline picks those up, runs more tests, um, and then pushes through the environment. So that's the general, you know, process. Um, so what we had to do was come up with like a test framework essentially for Lex itself. Um, you know, and unit testing conversations. So that's what we built into the pipeline was um, the ability to, um, you know, we had scripted conversations that we would run on every single build to make sure that a change, that we, you know, we may have added new utterances or new intents hadn't impacted the model and the answers for all the other um, intents. And we did find that, you know, a real... Um, a real benefit because, you know, we were making changes. We were, what made one thing work made a different thing break. So mm -hmm. refining it and constantly having that um, backup of we're not breaking it. And that's a standard process, but it was in a new world and a new right. sort of technology. So we had to think about how to apply those, what I would say, good practices to this new new way of creating software. Um so we did that. The other thing that was very important was the building of the bot itself. Um, you know, for anybody who has worked in a large enterprise company, um, there is certain rules <laughs> and standards and things that have to be put in place. And one of them is very specific around our usage of the public cloud in that we have um, a sandbox environment for people to um, prototype POC and um, learn about how to use new services but beyond that, everything has to be pushed through those accounts um, through code. So we had to come up with a whole build pipeline for Amazon Lex and the bot itself, um, which we created um, when we were waiting on literally um, 19th of April, because I was waiting on the date when it went GA and the build SDKs were released. Um, I think that's I think it surprised Amazon because we've heard from them um, after the fact that, you know, they just thought people would do it in the console. It's like, well, that, that's great for POC. It's not going to get us into production. Right. So that's what we worked um, on those aspects of it, which in the scheme of things, when you hear people talk about chatbots, it's not the things we talk about, but those are the practices that will get you into, you know, a, a chatbot environment that will, you know, scale to thousands of employees. And then with work grid software, obviously, thousands of employees across multiple countries and companies. So you're mm -hmm. in a multi-tenant chatbot environment. So it's really taken, you know, best practices, I think is what I would say, and bringing it into a chatbot world. Um, and now we're experimenting with voice 
um, how do you test the speech recognition, how do you do those things. So it's all very interesting, it's all very exciting, um, to be honest. Um, and I think it's probably clear, like, the, the, the driver or the, not the driver, the enabler for all this to me is, is the public cloud. Whichever one that you're working in is, you know, they've all comparative and competitive services. Um, but really, to me, it's the, the place that enables developers just to even get started with aspects of AI. Um, you know, if you do have an interest, it definitely is a place to experiment with. Have you run into any downsides or limitations associated with running in the public cloud or depending on the public cloud services? Um, I think the, I don't know if it's down, there's no real downsides because, um, you know, as we talked about earlier, like to, I personally feel that from an AI perspective um, that there's few companies that would be able to compete with some of the capabilities that are being made available in the public cloud. Um, just from the ease of use, um, the the rollout, like the new services that released at reInvent, for example, there are just so many new stuff. Um, you know, but I think the the downside, it's not downside, it's just an awareness of where your data is. You know, uh, make sure that you thoroughly think through what data you're trying to store. Um, you know, does it need to be anonymized? So there's just you know, I think a general understanding of how the cloud works needs to be there before you just start turning things on and sending data everywhere. Um, mm-hmm. But as I say, like, I have that. So, you know, every every service we use um, and it is assessed through, through a security process that we would have. Um, and I think not a downside, but just have an awareness um, of all the different services that you're potentially using in your um, product. Well, Jillian, thanks so much for taking the time to chat with us. Are there any final thoughts or things that you'd like to add? Um, I, th- I suppose uh, I have said it several times. I just see, you know, the voice um, as the future interface. And for people who are interested, you know, the ability now, the, you know, the Alexa and the developer skills SDK and the Google Assistant, you know, if anybody has any interest, they literally could start tomorrow and create simple skills and and have a go because it really opens your eyes to the potential um, of how, you know, certain aspects of AI are going to change our lives. Awesome. Well, Jillian, thank you. Thank you so much. It was great chatting with you. Thank you. All right, everyone, that's our show for today. For more information on Jillian or any of the topics covered in this episode, head on over to twimmelai.com slash talk slash 167. Don't forget to visit twimmelai.com slash nominate to cast your vote for us for this year's People's Choice Podcast Awards. As always, thanks so much for listening and catch you next time.